I feel absolutely 100% honored to introduce my friend and colleague, Ravi Alada, to us. Uh, he, we're in for a treat here. And um, uh, we all have one thing in common. We sleep. Some sleep more than others. I'm looking at Gil. I don't know. He sleeps a little bit, but he even sleeps. We sleep. And, but um, the relationship between the circadian biology, biological model, and he has like the impeccable credentials of, uh, you know, uh, being in Michael Rosbach's lab, who won the Nobel Prize for his contribution to establishing the model for um, the circadian rhythmicity. Uh, you know, and I think we're probably going to learn that this is not just having to do with humans, but it's something big, bigger, far bigger than that. Probably has to do with the sunrise and the sunset and some of the other things that are um, uh, cyclical. Uh, he he came from Ann Arbor, you know, and uh, was in our MST in our um, our uh, Interplex program, which we don't have anymore. We're and so he did his uh, combined bachelor's in biomedical science and then uh, MD here in Ann Arbor. And then he went off uh, on these, a uh, lot of affiliation with the Howard Hughes Medical Institute uh, in, 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 uh, in postgraduate work, like I described, but then ended up and established a wonderful career at Northwestern University at the Evanston campus, where he served as chair. So he was a chair for a lot about a dozen years of, uh, of the neurobiology well, with a strong emphasis on uh, uh, background and, and affiliations with physiology. And um, uh, it's a special time for us because he comes at a time when we have to do more to build a, and establish a world-class neuroscience institute. So we had one of the first institutes of neuroscience with the Mental Health Research Institute, where even the name neuroscience was invented here in the 50s. And then it, with Stan and Huda's leadership became the MBNI, Molecular and Behavioral Neuroscience Institute. Now it's a university-wide Michigan Neuroscience Institute and our first executive director and leader for that institute is Ravi. And uh, we are so fortunate to have it. So he's got that vision and responsibility, but he's also a leader in this kind of research. And that's what he's gonna tell us about today. So we are honored to have you. And it's my absolute pleasure to introduce you and welcome to our seminar and to DCMB where you spent the whole day. And thank you so much for coming. We look forward to your talk. Thanks, Brian. Um, Thanks for the uh, invitation to come talk to you today. Hope you can hear me okay. We're good. All right. Make sure all this works. All right. So as as Brian mentioned, I, I'm going to tell you about at least my version of trying to answer this question: Why do we sleep? Um, we know that uh, you can't. You spend roughly a third of your life asleep, um, and while you're asleep, you can't eat, you can't mate, you can't protect yourselves from predators, you can't care for your young. Um, you can't do many of the things that we would normally think of as being important for sustaining our species. Uh, yet, we all need to do it. In fact, virtually every creature we know on Earth that has been examined closely enough has to sleep, including even an organism as simple as a jellyfish. So we think this is sleep is fulfilling a very deep and ancient evolutionarily conserved function. Um, we know that if we don't sleep, a lot of bad things happen. Um, so for example, you're at risk of neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's disease. You're at higher risk of having depression. Um, you're even at risk of getting diseases that we don't ordinarily think of as diseases of the brain. So things like obesity, and diabetes are also a consequence of inadequate sleep. And if you feel like you don't get enough sleep, you're not alone. Tens of millions of people in this country do not get enough sleep and are likely um, suffering the consequences of that. Now, we do understand a lot of basic drives and why we do them. For example, why do we breathe? 
we need oxygen and we need to get rid of carbon dioxide. Why do we eat? Well, there's, you know, energy, calories and vitamins and minerals that we need. Um, but why do we sleep? We just don't have a comparable understanding of why we do that. Um, I was, I, I coined a phrase recently, which you may or may not like, but I call it, we're, we're, we're searching for, you know, if you, if you, why you breathe is you need oxygen. And I'll say why you sleep, you need sloxygen. Um, and so we don't, we, we're in search of sloxygen. Um, we'll see if that sticks. I don't think so, but we'll see. Anyway, we, yeah. sleep is a complex process. Um, and so, we, one way of organizing this question, and frankly, one that organizes my lab, is what's called the two process model. So we know there's a circadian clock and a homeostatic process, some people call this process H, which are important for driving sleep. So we know that the longer you're awake, the stronger this homeostatic drive gets. It accumulates over time, and the stronger the drive is sleep. So you, many of you have been awake for several hours, and that homeostatic drive is building up. And hopefully you're not gonna fall asleep uh, during my presentation because you also have process C and this process C is basically like an internal alarm clock. It keeps us awake, sustains wakefulness during the day. Once this alarm clock turns off in the evening, this homeostatic drive takes over and you dissipate um, that sleep drive. So when we think about the question, I'll come back to this a little bit later, when we think about the question of why we sleep, it's this homeostatic process, which is essential to understanding that question because the homeostatic process basically tells us that we need a certain amount of sleep. And if we don't get it, we have a strong drive to get it back. Um, but again, why? We don't really know. Now, I'm gonna first talk about some work on the circadian clock. And I love this um, quote from Charles Darwin, um, from, the, from his book, On the Origin of Species. Um, whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms most beautiful and most wonderful have been and are being evolved. And it's a reminder that life on Earth evolved in the context of the 24-hour environment driven by the Earth's rotation. Um, and really, it, what's what circadian clocks allow us to do is not only to respond to our environment, the sunrise, hey, I should get up, um, but actually to anticipate what's gonna happen in our environment. So you actually might wake up a little bit before dawn, if you will, the early bird catches the worm, might be the right analogy here to explain why this might be adapted. Now, as alluded to by Brian, a, a, a number of investigators, including my advisor, Michael Rosbash, I've worked out the mechanism of circadian clock, which I'll get into in a second. But what we learned from those studies is that circadian clocks are not a peculiar feature of a specific part of the brain, but in fact, circadian clocks are really a fundamental property of life. They are in fact um, everywhere. So circadian clock, the circadian clock mechanism summarized here, I'll, I'll come back to this in a bit, um, are in all of our organs and tissues where they control 24 hour timing. And so it's a kind of a, a universal mechanism um, and work from um, John Hoganesh's group where they profiled by um, transcriptomes and all organs and tissues across a 24 hour time showed that 50% of all protein coding genes, this is, might be an underestimate actually, 15% of all protein coding genes have rhythmic potential. That is they're under the control of the circadian clock in one or, or other uh, organs. And this includes most of the common drug targets of the most commonly prescribed drugs. So most of the time, we don't really pay attention to when we take the drug. You might get the, hey, you need to take this once a day, but they don't tell us when we should take it. But in fact, if this is correct, when we take the drug may be as important as, as how much we get of it. He gave some of that here. Very fast, ah. years. So it's also given the ubiquity of the circadian uh, regulation, it's not surprised that if you disrupt the circadian clock, you're at risk of, of diseases. Um, so for example, sleep is probably the most prominent 
uh, output of the circadian clock. So there's sleep phase disorders. I'll come back to a second. And there's a couple of um, disorders, if you will, shift work and jet lag are conditions where we impose on ourselves a misalignment between our internal clocks and what we're doing in the environments. So if you work at night, your clock is saying go to sleep, you're working, you suffer the consequences of that. Jet lag, and I'll come back to second, is really you travel across time zones, but you leave your clock back at your origin because it doesn't reset so quickly, and you suffer the consequences of that. Um, we can think of various disorders of the brain, so neurological diseases that I refer to, affective disorders, and of course, there are also diseases outside the brain because the clock is everywhere, obesity and cancer being two of the disorders, uh, diseases or types of disease that are, have been shown to result from disrupted circadian clocks. Now, I was interested in understanding what the role of the circadian clock was in humans, um, in, the, in the natural world, if you will. And so one of the things that I decided to do in collaboration with a statistician, um, uh, Tom Severini and an undergraduate, Alex Song, is to try to see if we can look at the impact of circadian disruption in the context of Major League Baseball. For any of you who are baseball fans, you know how many statistics you get out of that. Um, and of course, I'm also a baseball fan, so um, I was very interested in the study. Um, and so what we did is we took uh, 20 years of Major League Baseball games. This uh, amounts to 46,000 games, treating the home and, a, and away team games as sort of separate. Um, because of the density of the baseball schedule, we basically know when they travel and we know how many time zones they travel across. So we could uh, measure the degree of jet lag um, in, in, in these um, players. Um, and then of course, we used a multivariable regression analysis we separated the effects of home and away. We isolated the effects of team and park. Um, and then we also noted the direction of travel. And the reason we noted the direction of travel is because our internal circadian period for most of us is longer than 24 hours, circa meaning about. <laughs> um, so that means it's easier for us to go west. Our clocks are already a little slow. It's easier for us to sleep in and get up late, we all, we all experience this a little bit on the weekends. And it's hard for us to go east where we have to speed up our clocks because our clocks are a little bit slow to begin with. And so the direction of travel effects would tell us whether it's just an effect of travel because maybe you just don't like traveling or if it's really a circadian effect, it should be more evident east than going west. Um, this is uh, published work, um, but I'm just gonna, highlight the, the biggest effect. This is a heat map of p-values, red being more significant. And we had one result which was consistent in both the home team and the away team um, and was evident going east but not going west. And that was the number of home runs uh, pitchers give up. Um, and this was a pretty sizable effect. It's a comparable, it would essentially, if the pitcher had been jet lagged, they, that even if they're at home, they'll behave as if they're still on the road, that they're the away team. So it's a pretty strong effect. I'm also, um, you know, I attended medical school here at Michigan and I also did a residency in clinical pathology. Uh, and so I'm a pathologist. And so I was always interested in seeing if there's a way we could apply this understanding of the circadian clock to establish diagnostics. And to do this, um, uh, we were inspired by a Swedish botanist named Carl Linnaeus. And Carl Linnaeus had, because uh, who else are you going to be inspired by, really? Um, but Carl Linnaeus had an idea, and I emphasize this is an idea. Nobody has actually done the thing he proposed. So this is another project I want to do in my backyard. Um, and so what he proposed was there are different flowers bloom based on the time of day. And he thought if you arrange the flowers in the, in the form of a clock face, you could look at the, you could look at it and see which one's blooming and tell what time of day it was, all right? And I emphasize, there was actually a New York Times article written that nobody's actually done this, but if you wanted to try it, they gave some recommendations for what you could do. Um, we did this instead of with flowers, we did it with genes. 
Um, and so the idea was that different genes oscillate with a 24 hour period and they, they have different phases, some peak in the morning, some peak in the afternoon, some peak in the evening. And what we did is we used a, I, I should put my collaborators here first, and we did a study where we isolated um, blood at different times of day. This was done in collaboration with Phyllis Ziza, a sleep medicine neurologist at, at Northwestern, along with two uh, computational scientists, Bill Kapp and Rosemary Braun. And we developed some machine learning algorithms to identify signatures of genes which could predict time. And so this is just a summary of the data. I'm gonna show it in more detail where um, along the x-axis is the actual time the blood sample was taken, and the y-axis was what the algorithm predicted, and you get this nice diagonal line, which showed our prediction was pretty good. Um, and the strategy, and this is really something that Rosemary um, developed, she used a combination of, of circular regression, because time is a circle, um, along with elastic net regularization to identify the relevant um, predictors, she called this combination periodic elastic net, and we basically trained on a subset of data, which I'll show in a second, and then, and then validated it. Um, and shown here is just some of the data. There were three prior published studies which had blood uh, signature data across time. We trained it on this uh, subset of this first set from, from the Mahler study. Again, you clearly see these diagonal lines showing how well the model worked. We isolated our own data, and the first three studies were all done with microarrays. We then did RNA sequencing and similarly got very good predictions. Um, and just to summarize how accurate this was, this is a plot of um, how, how close our prediction was relative to the number of percent of samples. And um, basically our median errors for each of these studies was around an hour and a half to two hours. So that's how close our, our prediction was. Um, and not to, not to brag, but we were a little bit better than some of the other published predictors. Um, and we also, uh, this is just a list of the genes. So it was really 40 or so genes that if you measure the expression of those 40 genes, you could make this relatively accurate prediction. And I just list them here in case they're, some of your favorite genes are, are present. So just as to summarize this part, um, basically we had a, a strategy that um, in which we could, it, it used an internal normalization of, of the gene expression. So it could really use a wide type of sample types. Um, it's really independent of protocol and platform. It worked with microarrays and RNA-seq. It was relatively accurate, only required 40 genes. And the one weakness of this approach was that we needed at least two samples to do that normalization. Um, and of course, clinically actionable would be, we'd love to have someone walk into a, uh, their doctor's office, get a blood sample and basically tell something about their, about their circadian clock. So really advancing this to single samples. And there have been a few that have been published and we have some ideas for how to do that. And I'd love to get, you know, some of you in the room or on, on Zoom, your, hear your thoughts on, on ways you might think about solving this problem. We have a lot of data. We just need to know how to analyze it. Um, I did want to mention, uh, these, are, these are all assessments that tell you what time of day it is. So whether you're an early person, a late person, so it's really looking at phase. That's one feature of a circadian oscillation. Clinically though, amplitude might be a better, a more clinically, re more pathologically relevant. I use this example here of someone who might be a putative Alzheimer's patient. And one of the things I told you about before is circadian disruption, sleep disruption are associated with neurodegenerative diseases, including Alzheimer's. This is a, a kind of an actogram um, uh, where we're measuring just the activity of someone walking around. Um, you know, your, your watch can do this as well. Um, and you can see normally during the day active and at night they're, they're inactive. But this Alzheimer's person or putative Alzheimer's patient you can see their activity is no longer organized in this day-night fashion, right? So the, it's not that the timing has changed, it's not that getting up late or getting up early, just the whole rhythm has just been disrupted. So what we really want to do is to develop uh, um, algorithms that will tell us something about the amplitude of the rhythm. And so I'm just gonna sort of schematize one way I think about this. You can tell me, you, know, you can tell me what you think. 
So let's say you have like two oscillating genes, gene X and gene Y, okay? And let's say you were to, and this is like gene expression time, and they peak at different times of day. Maybe one is in the afternoon, one is in the evening. And if you were to plot the expression of gene X and gene Y against each other for all of the samples across time, you would get this nice uh, circle or ellipse, right? Indicating that it keeps coming back to the same point. So that would be an intact rhythm. Now, if it was suppressed, and this is just one way it can be suppressed and be suppressed in many ways, so they're now they're flat, if you were to plot that, you get this big like cluster here, right? And so the question is computationally, how would we distinct, how would we separate these two from each other? Um, and, and here's a critical question, I, and, and here's my assessment just from trying to do this a little bit, um, is if you take, if you just have one sample, it's possible that this could lie on this circle, this ellipse, right? So you probably need more than one sample to actually get at this amplitude question, but I'm gonna leave it open as someone else can solve this, uh, this conundrum, if you will. The other thing I wanna mention is the complexity of circadian disruption. Imagine I showed you those 40 genes, right? And they're all oscillating. What if certain subsets of those genes stop oscillating in certain types of disease states? If you notice some of those genes are immune related, so maybe an autoimmune disease, some of them would be disrupted and other ones are more related to nutrient. And those aren't disrupted, right? So when we talk about circadian disruption, there may be a, 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 a quite a large number of different ways one can disrupt the clock. And I think that it would be very interesting if those are associated with like specific organ dysfunction or specific um, disease states. So I think there's a lot of power here in terms of diagnostics. And I would just add on top of that, by and large, when we do diagnostics, we're just taking a blood sample and we say, oh, look, it's high or it's low. Incorporating this dimension of circadian time into those measurements, I think could add a whole new uh, way of looking at some of these diagnostic biomarkers. Robbie, is this, is this a, an example of circadian dysregulation? Yeah. 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 Well, I'm. 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 There are many ways one can talk about this. It's that I, I say amplitude desynchro. You could desynchronize the rhythm and get this. You could. So there's many. Dip, there isn't a single word for this, and you'd have to look more deeply to, to know precisely what's going on. I don't know if I'm Lynn, but I think the Fourier transform could be valuable too. I mean, you know, it's phase information, amplitude and phase. And yeah. Rhythmicity. That's that's about Fourier. Okay. So I'm going to make a big uh, transition here, and talk about my other, <laughs> the other half of my brain, um, which is about the fruit fly. Um, so one of the ways we've been trying to attack the question of circadian rhythm and sleep has been using the fruit fly as a as a model system, and as I point out here, um, fly is a very simple brain but relatively complex behavior. Um, so the fly does things like learning and memory, including long-term memory, um, which I'll talk about in a bit. Um, fly has been a great model for aging, as many of you know, Scott Pletcher here at uh, Michigan. Um, flies have also been used as models for diseases such as Alzheimer's and, and even autism. Uh, and the real power of the fly is the economy of scale. Um, I always like to say, if this doesn't gross you out, you should come join my lab. Um, <laughs> but we can grow large numbers of flies uh, cheaply and easily. Um, and so it really facilitates certain large scale experiments, one of which I'm gonna show you now, which is we can actually measure sleep-wake behavior in the fly. Um, basically, it's we put a fly into these small glass tubes. Um, auger food is on one end, an infrared beam is in the middle. And we basically count the number of the times the fly breaks that infrared beam over a certain time period, um, which I'll talk about in a second. And um, here's what the data look like. So it's kind of like that act activity profiles I showed you for the humans. Um, but for the flies, they tend to also be active during the day and tend to be inactive at night. Um, and you can see under constant darkness conditions, um, so no temperature change, no light change, the fly continues to show activity and inactivity and occurring at about the same time each day, reflecting its internal um, circadian clock. 
And the fly also shows these long periods of inactivity during the night, which has all the attributes of sleep. And I hope to convince you a little bit later that they're actually sleeping. So we score basically, if the fly hasn't cr crossed this beam in five minutes, we count that as sleep. And just to give you a sense of the scale of experiments in my lab, we can look at 8,000 single flies at any given time. Um, and we're measuring this activity beam break every minute. Um, so I, I'll let you more talented people do the math on how many data points we're collecting in a year, but it's a lot. Um, so this has been a very powerful system. So this is the flies, uh, again, normal behavior under a light dark cycle. Had, uh, flies have a peak in the morning, a peak in the evening, and this kind of midday siesta in the middle of the day. And it was work from Kanapka and Benzer during the late 1960s and early 1970s, where they did genetic screens looking for fly mutants that disrupted or altered this rhythm. They identified a mutant they called period and the short allele because um, these flies woke up early and uh, both in the morning and in the evening, reflecting a fast circadian clock. Um, and work later from uh, once the gene was cloned, identified a mutation in the middle of the per gene and a serine to uh, a sparagene mutation. Um, later, fast forward uh, 30 or 40 years, uh, Louis Patashek and Yingwei Fu were doing human genetics of circadian rhythms, and they identified a family with a syndrome called familial advanced sleep phase syndrome. So it's inherited in an autosomal dominant manner. And they also wake up early. Um, they wake up at three o'clock in the morning and go to bed around seven in the evening. Um, and when they identified the gene responsible for that, it was also in the human ortholog of the Drosophila period gene. and was also a mutation in a serine residue to glycine in the middle of that, uh, middle of that protein. So what it really told us was that watching these fruit flies walk back and forth in these little glass tubes could actually tell us something about our own uh, sleep-wake cycle. And um, as, as uh, Brian noted, this led to the awarding of the uh, 2017 uh, Nobel Prize for the discovery of this mo uh, molecular mechanism. Now, we know that PER is part of a transcriptional feedback loop in which PER transcription is activated, PER is phosphorylated, and then it represses its own activation. Um, and that's the core gears of our circadian clock. Um, and these transcriptional feedback loops are present within specific neurons in the brain that ultimately govern um, this timed behavior. Um, so one of the questions that we were interested in was trying to understand how does this transcriptional feedback loop control the activity of these neurons to ultimately regulate sleep-wake behavior? And to do this, um, we worked with Indira Raman at Northwestern um, and a very talented postdoc, Matt Florakis, and he performed patch clamp electrophysiology of some of these neurons. Now, flies are small, fly brains are small, and fly neurons are really, really small. So this is not a, this is a very technically difficult experiment to do. Um, Matt was able to do it. What you can clearly see is that in the morning, these neurons fire lots of action potentials. In the evening, they're relatively silent, reflecting the circadian function. Um, and in fact, the, the membrane potential, the firing rate is changing, but also the resting membrane potential is also going, uh, more depolarized in the morning, more hyperpolarized in the evening. Um, and what we then did is ask the question, well, what might be causing this change in activity? To do this, we did transcriptomics to try to identify clock-regulated genes, um, specifically from this group of neurons that we had recorded from. Um, and this just shows a heat map of time versus gene expression. And you can see various modules of morning genes, afternoon genes, night genes. Many of the known clock genes are, are present here. Um, it was really well over a thousand genes are under the control of a circadian clock, one of which turns out to be a gene called um, NLF or an NA localization factor. And basically what we found is that the clock transcription factor, which is also activating the PER gene, activates NLF1. NLF1 interacts with an ion channel called NA or narrow abdomen. It also happens to be a sodium leak channel. That's a coincidence. 
Um, NLF transports Na to the membrane, which depolarizes the cell, causes them to fire more action potentials. In the evening, the system is turned off. Potassium channel, which hyperpolarizes the cell, takes over, and you get a relatively silent cell. And ultimately, this is what drives that daily rhythm in sleep-wake behavior. Now, when we first uh, identified this mechanism of how the clock was controlling this, and we submitted the paper, we were told that this might be some peculiar fly thing. Was it actually true in, in, in an organism that everybody cares about, which is, of course, the mouse? Um, and so we actually went and collaborated with uh, Martha Vita Turner and Fred Turek at Northwestern. Um, and here's just a, a mouse and a cross section with the SCN, the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is part of the hypothalamus that regulates our daily sleep wake cycle. Um, and we found there that we could recapitulate the published studies showing that they, um, uh, they're fire, they spontaneously fire. And when we knocked out the homolog of the narrow abdomen or NA channel, NALCN, we also get very poor firing. And we also see this day night. Um, uh, activity change in the amount of this uh, sodium leak current. So we see this relatively modest change. And so we wanted to know, I'm just skip, wanted to know if we knock out this gene, what happens to um, the, the mouse circadian behavior? So mice, we measure their rhythm by wheel running. So you can, so you can see they, they are also nocturnal, not diurnal like flies in us. So these mice are running at night. And of course, when you let them go into constant darkness, you can see they, they wake up, if you will, earlier and early, earlier. That reflects the fact that their circadian clock is actually a little shorter than 24 hours. But when we knock out this NALCN channel, you see something that's a little bit different. First, it's, it's not as short as the control, and it gets longer and longer and longer the longer you leave them. So the period is long, and it's also not very stable. So it's evidence that in fact, this channel is in fact um, doing something important in the, for the behavior of the, of the mouse. Um, I did wanna just mention also that um, uh, we collaborated with Casey Diekman. I don't know if anyone knows him in this room. Exactly, that's why I wanted to mention it. Um, and he, he worked with, um, with Danny Forger yeah. and they developed a model for SCN um, activity. And, so I was working with Casey on a project and he's now at um, New Jersey Institute of Technology. Um, and I also play basketball with him. Um, and Casey, Casey developed this model. And so we just asked the question, is the modulation of this ion channel sufficient to recapitulate some of the known properties of the SCN? So we plugged in the change that we found. And basically we found that this modest change in, so in NALCN conductance could essentially recapitulate the firing rates that we observe. So if you think about it, and for those who are more electrophysiologically minded, a small change in the resting membrane potential triggers a lot of voltage dependent channels. So it's kind of like a feed forward, positive feedback loop where a small change in this leak conductance can have a profound change on the physiology of the, uh, ion, of the neurons. And for us, another, it, it reinforced a, a, a fundamental truth in my mind which is that it appears that not only was this core mechanism, the PER gene conserved, but also how the PER gene controls neurons is also conserved. So it suggests that the neural mechanisms of sleep-wake are fairly widely um, conserved. So that gear? The gear is conserved, but also how that gear is connected to the hands of the clock, if you will, okay, and how that controls the neurons and how those neurons ultimately control. So, so it really told us that trying to under, we, this was all in the circadian domain. Could we use the fly to understand that sleep homeostat, to understand that question of, of, of why do we sleep? So to address the question of why do we sleep, I borrow heavily from the success we've had in studying the circadian clock. And so obviously a cornerstone of the circadian clock is the feedback loop that's at the, is the gears of the clock. Um, and so you can think about uh, any homeostatic system, but even the sleep homeostatic system as a feedback loop. Um, so first off, you can think of various things that keep us awake, whether it's the sun, 
whether it's the circadian clock, whether it's hunger. And of course, hopefully these stimuli elicit us to be awake, various waking behaviors that are hopefully adaptive. Um, and these lead to the production of various factors. We call them factor S, maybe it's sloxygen, who knows. Um, and ultimately, if you're awake long enough, these are sensed in the brain and these trigger sleep, helping to restore factor S to its homeostatic um, set point. Now, if like many people, you don't sleep well, um, you will suffer the consequences. So for example, people who've been awake for 20 hours on average um, actually perform motor tasks comparable to someone who's driving under the influence. Um, and this has impacted things like call schedules for residents and, and things like that, because you don't want your surgeon to be drunk. Um, also, uh, you have poor memory. So if you don't get a night of sleep, you um, don't retain memories very well after you, you've learned something. Um, and, uh, you know, I always want to ask people when I give a test, um, you know, how, I want the last question should be, how many hours of sleep did you get last night? And then I want to do a plot of hours of sleep versus test scores. We'll see. Um, maybe we can work with learning health sciences on that project. Um, and then, of course, as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of evidence now that you're at risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. So epidemiological studies have shown that people who, who show some like early indications of Alzheimer's, if you, don't, if you have poor sleep, you're at much higher risk of developing Alzheimer's, say, 10 years later. Um, and you're also at elevated risk of getting depression. Um, so there's a lot of evidence now that sleep is doing all these things, how that's happening, those are some of the questions we'd be interested in answering. So really at the core of our research program is what is factor S? How is it sensed? And how does sleep restore it back to baseline levels? Um, how does sleep promote memory? And how does it slow neurodegenerative diseases? And to answer these questions, we are in fact using the fruit fly again to, to try to address this. Um, sure. Could there be other inputs like stress or anxiety? Are they on the input side or the output? Uh, they may be both because I, so for example, one thing is obviously stress can keep you awake and give you poor sleep, but it's also been shown that sleep, inadequate sleep makes you much more anxious. Right. So it's, it's just, a, it's a futile cycle where you get less sleep and then you sleep poorly and then you get more, or so you get more stressed and you handle stress poorly and you get more reactive and you eat poorly, you, you do all sorts of bad stuff if you don't sleep. But there's also something called uh, um, insomnia anxiety. So where you, you, you can't sleep because you're worried you're not getting enough sleep. <laughs> so don't do that. <laughs> so try to relax. Um, so, uh, so I told you a lot about the circadian clock and that we came up with this fundamental mechanism. So what we're really the goal of the lab is really to try to do this for the homeostat. Um, that is to come up, what is the molecular program that composes this homeostat? And where in the brain is this homeostat located if, if in fact there is a part of the brain? Okay, so first off, I just wanna convince you that fruit flies in fact do sleep. Um, so what are the, what are the, what's the evidence for that? Um, well, they stop moving for one, that, that's that bean break assay, but when they stop moving, they are, they're also harder to get them to move. So it would have what's called an elevated arousal threshold. So you, the stimulus you need to get them to move is greater or pretty high when they, when they go to sleep. Um, if you deprive a fly of a night of sleep, they actually try to catch up the next day. If you train a fly on a task and then you deprive them of sleep after you've trained them, they are unable to consolidate memories, just like in us. Um, sleep is under the control of a circadian clock. And if you record activity in the brain, there are actually electrical correlates of, of sleep. And if you give the fly caffeine, the Starbucks test, you will keep the fly awake. So all the attributes that we think about sleep, the fly seems to have all of those. 
and uh, yeah, this this video is moving, so the fly is uh, is in fact sleeping here. And I'll talk about that little extension in a second. So initially, we wanted to know where in the brain this was working. To do this, we actually used a, to, a, a, a thermogenetic tool called Shabiri TS. It's a dominant temperature sensitive, dominant negative blocker of synaptic transmission. And you can express it in specific neurons and essentially remote control those neurons by just changing the temperature. Flies can't control their body temperature, so that um, works pretty well. It's the work of one of my first grad students, Jenna Pittman. Um, and uh, this predates like optogen optogenetics is what many people use today, but this actually predated that technology. Um, and so what we're looking, we basically cycled flies between a, a warm temperature and a cold temperature. And we were looking for situations where when we blocked synaptic transmission at the warm temperature, the fly would stop sleeping. They'd be awake. Because you can imagine if I turn off synaptic transmission, the fly might just stop moving altogether. We wanted to see the opposite. And presumably we would be inhibiting a part of the brain that was promoting sleep. Um, so we found these. And in fact, they all, in fact, label a part of the brain called the mushroom bodies, which are kind of the fly cortex and hippocampus. It's most well known for its role in learning and memory, which is obviously a, a process intimately linked um, with sleep. Um, we also uh, doing some deeper analysis of, of uh, sleep in the fly and its and movements the fly makes. We notice that the fly has its proboscis, its mouth part, it extends it and contracts it. And it was doing this in a non-purposeful way. Usually the fly does this to eat, um, kind of like an elephant trunk. Um, but this was like very repetitive and stereotyped. Um, and it was doing it during deep sleep. I, I can talk about all the pieces of evidence for why we knew they were sleeping. Um, and uh, basically we showed that if we block this, the fly is unable to clear out waste from its brain. So we call this the, I call this the brainwashing function of sleep. Um, and interestingly in humans, they also show changes in CSF fluid flow that are coupled to what is thought to be the restorative part of sleep, which is slow wave sleep. So while we don't have a proboscis, somehow we think, you know, the speculation is this is convergent evolution. That is the fly has, has this figured out a way to wash its brain and we have our own way of washing our own brains during sleep. And this is like one of the big hypotheses about what does sleep do? And of course, if in fact this is fundamental to sleep, the core question becomes what's the substance or substances that are being cleared out? Because that might be the factor S, the sloxygen, whatever, whatever you want to call it. So we're doing a lot of metabolomics now looking at what might be in the CSF equivalent of the fruit fly. Love to work with some human uh, clinical investigators to see whether they may, we may also collaborate and see if there's anything in common there. Um, there is also some evidence that this is part of the homeostat. So you can think of various signals. There's a circadian signal that oscillates irrespective of time of day. Um, there's state, you're awake, then you're asleep, you're awake, then you're asleep. Um, and then there's homeostatic signals, which accumulate slowly during wakefulness, dissipate during sleep, accumulate during wakefulness and dissipate during sleep. So when we looked at this proboscis extension, this mouth part extension, so sleep is, sleep flies tend to sleep more at night and less during the day. And we look at the proboscis extensions, they don't fully track just the sleep state. What you see is they accumulate during the day and then they dissipate at night, suggesting that the proboscis extensions are actually removing the signal that stimulates the proboscis extensions, that it might actually be clearing out this key homeostatic factor. This is evidence, but it suggests that it might be part of this homeostatic mechanism. Again, what's the substance? We don't know. Okay. So in the last, last bit here, I'd just like to talk a little bit about some of the work we've been doing to both get at where this homeostat might be located in the fly and also what the might be the underlying molecular mechanisms of homeostasis. Um, looking at the clock here a little bit. Yeah, a few minutes. So I may go through this a little bit quickly. Some of the details aren't crucially important, but we did another thermogenetic screen 
where we looked at about 500 different drivers targeting different parts of the brain and using this thermogenetic technique, this was with TRIP-A1, so it's really activating the neurons, not silencing synaptic transmission, and then look at changes in sleep. Um, we identified one set of neurons that we call slumber neurons, that when we activate them, shown here in red, relative to the controls, they go to sleep, so they sleep a lot more, but interestingly, the next day, they actually sleep less. So this is evidence that not only did they stop moving, but they were actually dissipated their drive. So if you get a lot of sleep, then well, then the next day you don't need as much. And so it suggested that it was having the restorative aspect of sleep. And I'll show more evidence for that. Um, and yeah, I'll just skip through that. This just shows the expression pattern. You're not fly neuroanatomist, so I don't think you have a huge interest in this, except what I'll just say is one of the things we've been doing to try to figure out what these cells are is taking that pattern I just showed you and then doing single cell uh, RNA sequencing to try to identify the cell types that are part of this population. And we're also interested just as a future experiment, if we sleep deprived the fly, do we see changes in gene expression in any one or more of these clusters that might indicate one of them is part of this homeostat? But that's sort of a future study. Um, we also showed um, that activation of these slumber neurons could actually improve memory um, we use a courtship memory assay where a male fly, a fly, a female fly that's already mated will reject other males. Um, and so a male that's been rejected enough times will basically learn to stop courting the female. So suppression of courtship is evidence of memory. Um, and so what we did is when we active, we trained them in this courtship assay, we activate these neurons and you can see that the amount of courtship goes down after activation of these neurons, suggesting that we are able to improve memory by activating these slumber neurons. We've also done this in the context of an Alzheimer's model where we express an, a mutant form of A-beta, um, which causes early onset Alzheimer's. Um, they show an age, this is courtship memory again. You see this age dependent loss in courtship memory. So now they're courting a lot after the training. And when we activate these slumber neurons, we can restore them back. We can restore their memory in these Alzheimer's, aged Alzheimer's flies, suggesting that a night of sleep can be quite therapeutic for cognitive function. Okay. So in the last, and so we're trying to figure out exactly what those neurons are, and of course, what might be going on molecularly within those neurons. In the last bit, I just want to talk about a general kind of omics approach we've been using because it's a very large data set. And we're, I won't say, I'm, I won't quite say I'm at a loss for how to do it, but I think many of you in the audience may have a lot of ideas about how one might look at this data set. Um, and the idea was, could we identify what might be the factors or genes that are changing that are sleep-wake dependent? Um, and so what we did is we used a uh, a large variety of manipulations, actually 19 different manipulations of sleep and wake, um, nine different ones that looked at spontaneous sleep and wake. So you normally get up and you go to sleep. We can measure gene expression under those conditions. We also made use of this thermogenetic activation. So we can activate a wake circuit. We can activate a sleep circuit and look at impact on gene expression. And then lastly, we can do mechanical sleep deprivation where we deprive them uh, mechanically and keep them away. Then we assess their transcriptomes using RNA sequencing. We did this in many different ways. We did whole brains. We just take the whole brain and measure them. We can sort, fact sort specific neurons that we know to play a role in sleep and or circadian rhythms. And then lastly, we used an approach called a TRAP or translating ribosome affinity purification that allowed us to isolate transcripts from a specific um, cell group, in this case, we use glia. And then we also have an, an RNA binding protein we've been working with, and we looked at transcripts associated with that RNA binding protein. And I just list a bunch of the different, you, these don't mean anything to you, but they're just listing a, a number of the different cell types that we looked at. And then lastly, we use a variety of like algorithms, many of them are standard in the field, basically to look at either differential gene expression between the wake and the sleep condition, or we often, if we looked at a time course across 24 hours, we looked at those genes that peak 
at the wake time period when we think homeostatic drive is at its peak and when homeostatic drive is at its lowest. And then lastly, we've been trying various correlation techniques. So one that was suggested to me by James Fitzgerald is a computational neuroscientist. Um, he suggested ca canonical correlation analysis. I don't know a lot about this. So maybe some of you do. But what we tried to do is we asked, we think that genes will reflect something about sleep-wake history. So we have the sleep-wake of all of these animals, okay? We know when we collected the sample. And so we can ask the question, which genes correlate with sleep over what time period? So we can say zero to three hours, they slept a certain amount. Is that correlated with gene expression? Zero to six hours. So over what time period is sleep-wake history being integrated to what we think is dictate that level of gene expression? So I'm just gonna show, we're very early in this and I, I don't know if we're stumbling around, but we're just early in this process. But these just shows you some of the examples where we look at sleep on the x-axis. And these are just, since our gene expression is from populations of flies, I'm showing you all the individual flies of that population in terms of their sleep. And then this is the gene expression level for a given gene. And this just shows the correlation between um, sleep levels in the three hours preceding that sample and the level of that gene. So it just shows, it's just, this is very early days. We're, I'm, by no means um, ha have we solved this problem, but I just sort of put it out there as like, this is a problem what we, we we're trying to work on. Now, one of the things we learned in this process, because what I was hoping for is that we would find the per gene, the equivalent of the per gene, that one gene that always goes, no matter how you mess up sleep and wake, it always goes up and always comes down when you go to sleep. And when we looked at across all of our data sets, we did not find that gene, okay? So one of the ideas that I started to think about is that maybe there isn't the single circadian clock. Maybe there's actually multiple homeostats and that each of those homeostats is tuned to a different feature of waking experience. Like maybe you were, you're really hungry. And so that's gonna override the fact that something else is telling you you need to go to sleep because it's not adaptive for you to sleep if you need food, for example. So I'm thinking now that maybe there are different homeostats for different conditions and that each of those may contribute to whether you fall asleep or not. Um, and in fact, one of the things is we know that in each of these conditions, there aren't many overlapping genes. So PER is a kind of a universal gene. Um, and so I think that the gene expression may reflect that it may be molecularly distinct. So each of these homeostats may use a different genetic program to accomplish um, sleep homeostasis. So I just sort of summarize these findings here. We had no single gene that was uniformly associated with sleep and wake. Um, there are many, I should have said, many genes do show consistent changes with sleep and wake, meaning that there are genes that when they change, they always go up with wake, for example. They just don't always change in every paradigm. So there's consistency, but again, not in every condition. Um, and there are many genes that show up in multiple conditions, just not in all of them. So those represent probably high value candidates to, to get into. Um, and I showed you some genes that may correlate with sleep-wake history. So really we're gonna, what we really want to do is get into some gene network and pathway architecture of sleep and wake and really use the power of fly genetics to get at the functional significance of, of some of these genes. So I'll stop and there and just um, talk about the people who really did a lot of the unpublished work here to really highlight the work of Clark Rosenzweig, who's really been doing the heavy lifting in the sleep homeostasis project. Young Q Kim has done a lot of the work on learning and memory that I talked about. And Shiju Sisaban has been on a lot of the computational analysis of our, of our omics data. So I'll stop there and happy to take all, any of your questions. Yeah, go ahead. Cameron, maybe give him the mic. Yeah. First, you know, this uh, one on one. If there's not a single homeostat, there has to be an integrator. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's something that basically takes all the information and makes a decision whether to sleep or wake or not. Yeah. 
The thing is that thing itself may not itself be homeostatic. It may be a switch. And in fact, there's uh, just not to get into too much detail, there's a little bit of evidence when people have started working out some of the fly circuitry that there is such a, such a thing. Yeah. I mean, the, the, all the cell, I mean, all the cells have these genes and, you know, but every cell, I mean, you know, is this happening at the level of the cell within various tissues? I mean, this yeah, is like... that's my bias. Oh. So there's, 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 a, there's a, in the field, we call it this, there's a soup model and there's the wires model. The, the soup people are like the brainwashers and the, they think that this is a general mechanism. It happens in the, the, whole, the whole brain. Um, you can just take a chunk of cortex out and you just grind it up and you'll find this, what's going on there. And then there's the, the wires people are the, oh, you need to get these hypothalamic neurons. They connect to those neurons and that triggers that state. Now there's obviously evidence for either of these. Um, what I would say is that probably some of the core mechanisms are general because I think they hit on fundamental properties of neuronal homeostasis. Right, so neurons are home homeostatic in terms of the amount they fire action potentials because action potentials and synaptic transmission are metabolically quite taxing. And so it's really important for the neuron to be able to control how much energy it's gonna expend on this activity, hopefully not wasting it. Um, but at the same time, there are specific neurons and maybe it's akin to more of the, that the, the circuit part of it is more of like a switch. It's just switching things on and off in response to these more fundamental mechanisms. So besides the sleep-wake and the um, diurnal clock, there are other clocks apparently. In December, maybe you were there, I think we did. Yeah, the, we talked about, I did not that see seminar, the seminar, uh, Mustafa from yeah. UCSF, mm -hmm. studies centrioles. Yes. And claims to have found a uh, clock and mechanism and phenomenon in that organelle. How widely diverse are these clocks? Related to my question. Yeah, yeah, pretty, I think they're pretty diverse because, um, and, 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 and some, of the, some of the computational people here will be, will, will, I'll, I'm speaking out of expertise at the moment, but it, I'm thinking of the work of um, uh, Mike Elowitz, I think showed this, I don't know if he's the org originator of this, but you can create these kind of synthetic oscillators, right? So any negative feedback loop has some propensity to oscillate if you create a delay between the activation and the, and the feedback. So it may be that systems have a proclivity to oscillate, some of which will be retained by evolution, others aspects will be modified. And so I think the, the, the notion that there's a lot of oscillatory systems, I think is not, um, I'll just say not unexpected, but, but maybe important. What's for How would you say um, conditions like anxiety or depression might be, uh, um, um, uh, genes might be that are, are homeostatic for, for the circadian rhythm might also be uh, um, uh, serving dual purposes or, or being affected or triggering uh, conditions like anxiety or depression and thereby there is this uh, cross kind of uh, uh, impact that is, you know, leads to disruption or, or interference with circadian rhythm. And then like you were indicating earlier, this vicious yeah. cycle that one uh, triggers the other and, and so on and so on. I, absolutely. I mean, um, I can't remember, I was talking at lunch a little bit about some GWAS studies where they find a lot of associations between circadian rhythm changes and various mental illnesses. So again, what's chicken and egg there? Is the gene for one and that causes the other one or is it for the circadian rhythm and it's causing them depression, for example? Um, we don't know, but absolutely, there's definitely a lot of interactions there. One thing to keep in mind though is 
and this gets in a little bit of the biology and, and I was talking with Brian a little bit about things like wearables, like developing good measures of the circadian clock as we try to do blood is gonna be really important because a lot of things can mask those rhythms, right? You know, if you go out to a party and you stay up all night, doesn't mean your circadian clock is messed up. The clock is, if I took your blood, in fact, in some of those studies, I didn't, you might've noticed there was like some different colors there. Some of those studies were done under total sleep deprivation. So the clock continues to run in the face of all manner of perturbations. So that's why it causes problems for us for jet lag, because it'd be great if you just flew to a different time zone and your body just said, oh, I'm going to totally reset my clock to the new time zone. Um, it doesn't do that because um, the, the value of a clock is in its stability to keep time, right? After, yeah, yeah, it, the, the, the rule of thumb for phase shift for jet lag is one hour a day. So if you go six time zones, it should take you six days. Although some people tell me they have no problem with jet lag. I don't, I don't know who these people are. <laughs> All right. Robbie, you mentioned temperature a couple of times. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's you. I mean, I see that, you know, I know it was your, uh, it was a, a symbol for something uh, for your homeostat. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, temperature seems to be a pretty big one. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, so there must be, and that might, that, that could be definitely something we could track with the wearable. You know? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and we know, I mean, anyone, you may have this experience where your body temperature drops as a function of homeostatic drive. So when you go to sleep, many people will sweat because your body's trying to like lower its core body temperature. It's both a sleep driven thing and circadian is that both of those things are occurring. We have a remote question for you. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh yeah. Hi, this is Lana Hammer. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, I have two, two questions, naive questions. The first one is that, that you know, in cancer care, there's always driver and passenger uh, roles. Uh, I wonder if cicada wisdom is, is there such a thing? That since you mentioned it's not one single gene, but it's a, you know, a system that, that operates together to 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 have this clock maintained, but if the clock is disturbed in pathological processes, there has to be something to start the the start the the problem, right? So I was wondering if there is any kind of you know major fall player versus the ones that just come along. That's my first question. There was a couple right in the beginning. I heard passenger, and you know, I was there's a little bit we we're having a hard time hearing you. So, yeah. could you just repeat the please repeat yeah. the essence of the question slowly or give us an out? I think it's on the camera. Oh, uh, my question is there a, a, is there a major player versus the ones that just you know, there, there's, a, there's a passenger, there's a driver mutations in cancer. Does the same concept apply in, in circadian rhythm? clock genes that that came out clearly go ahead robbie yeah i i'm not a, i'm not i'm not aware of that i'm not aware of that um yeah, but i guess i would also i think I, I i was sort of intimating from what you were saying is like there's also evidence there is evidence of circadian clock disruption in cancers i don't know if that's what you're also asking about but i'm not aware of, of that issue let's see She's gonna. He's gonna put up the Hollywood Square so we can see what we're doing here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Can you get everybody on there. Yeah. Go ahead. Let's see what we got. That's real, but we have about twelve people on our viewing room. And click it okay. again, and then stretch it, and you'll get everybody. So. Any more questions from Zoom? Do you study the effect of a med a meditation? Uh, <laughs> I have not. I have not. 
questions what? left. You, we had about 20. Yeah, you, you can't imagine, though, that, you know, this. that's why I was asking about the inputs on the uh, anxiety, because mm -hmm. you can definitely imagine if there's some kind of calming effect mm -hmm. on the input side, that that could help. Help in terms of? Well, you know, they have, you you know, reducing the uh, blue light input yeah. stimulus, yep. uh, you know, just uh, mm -hmm. turning down the lights, yep. being quiet, not too much stimulus right at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So, and it's, again, this stuff we can collect with the wearables and, and do some behavior mods for some of the stuff that's gonna keep you awake. Yep, yep, absolutely. Is there, is, are there restrictions on the human study side of things? I mean, is that, because it seems like a big opportunity if you could kind of crosswalk that more with the humans. And you mentioned you want to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, not, there, there are regulations about human yeah, research sure. other than that, which I'm sure many people are able to, to, to uh, get like a that big, done. Like a big collaboration with the Sleep Lab or yeah, something. Yeah, like that. yeah. Okay, anybody else? June? Anybody else? All right. Well, thank you so much for uh, coming and spending the time with us and uh, sharing your own research. And uh, I know you've been sharing re uh, vision about the uh, MNI during the day, and we look forward to continued uh, conversation at the dinner. Thank Great. you so much. Yeah, thanks.